Turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. We're glad to have a first-time visitor in our service today, Jody Nolan. Amen. All right. Good to have Jay's mother here with us today. And good to see Gary and Louise back in service today. Amen. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Getting back to the basics of the church is a must, I believe, in our day and time. If there's to be any growth or survival, are you listening? Some have not tuned in their ears yet. Too many churches are in a pattern of complacency or laziness. I don't know what you want to call it. It's obvious that we're living in the last days. But too many are satisfied with just that all the bills are paid, plenty of money coming in to keep afloat. Family and friends get together on Sunday for a time of visiting each other, kind of like a family reunion. And many going through a form of worship. I'm talking about many churches throughout our land today. The evidence is in the decline. Churches are not social clubs. Churches are more like hospitals. What is the real purpose of the church in having church meetings, times of worship together? Let me ask you a personal question. I know you don't want to answer it. But I want you to give it some thought. If you found out this morning that you were not doing right in some ways, would you be willing to change those ways? Or would you make the choice to continue doing things, what you're doing, and not make any changes, even though some things are wrong. I title this message today, What is the Number One Purpose of the Church? I could give you the answer very quickly, which I will, but then we will give a little exposition on those answers. Number one, it's winning souls, it's baptizing believers, and it's making disciples out of believers. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I believe that's the Great Commission. Too many with names on church rolls say, I can't win souls, and then give every excuse conceivable for not doing so while the church dwindles in growth and development. Fingers are pointed to those who they want to blame for the decline 
in souls being saved, baptisms, church growth, development of disciples, and so on. And usually, there's one but one person to blame. Who's that? Huh. It's the preacher's fault. You've heard that, haven't you? Never said that, but I know you've heard that. And there's no doubt that preachers could do better and must do so. But the house of God, we cannot blame everything on somebody else. Not to be placed on just one or even one central place. The fact is, every member is to blame. You know, we're living in a society where the nobody wants to take responsibility or the blame for anything. It's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else caused me to do this. Many years ago, a comedian said, the devil made me do it. You remember that, don't you? Well, let's, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. The devil's still making a lot of people do things that are not right. Because he don't want you and I to have a good, positive relationship with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want the Holy Spirit to have control of our lives. And so when we openly say we wouldn't listen to the devil and do what the devil wants us to do, but in essence, in many ways, we're doing just exactly what the devil wants us to do. Neglecting the very work, the very task, the very commission that God has given churches to do, church members to do. So every church member it's to blame when the church of the living God is not progressing as it should. We all have a task to do. Several things can be done, but will not be done if we do not accept the fact that we can do something if we're willing. We can do something different if we're willing. If not, then view the consequences of what will happen. You've heard this phrase of saying, which is so true. You can't do the same old thing the same old way and expect different results. So, I subtitle this, the main title of this is to consider that question, what's the real number one purpose of the church? And on title this, you can win souls. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Look at it again. The fruit of the righteous is what? A tree of life. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. A better translation might be, he that is wise wins souls. Look at the scripture, and we're just going to consider three different thoughts on this particular passage. Look at the verse again. The first phrase says, the fruit of the righteous. So my number one point in this message is, are you a righteous person? You see, the prerequisite to winning souls is being a righteous 
person. You say, oh, that sounds egotistical. It sounds like it's pious. It sounds like we're trying to exalt ourselves. No. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, it's with the heart man believes unto righteousness. So are you a believer? Are you righteous? With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The scripture defines what righteousness is. Every child of God is a righteous person in God, in Christ, not of the flesh, but in Christ. Are you a righteous person? Are you a saved person? Are you a born again believer? Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. Define the word righteous. I looked it up in the dictionary just to get the direct uh, words that are uh, have the same meaning. The words such as virtuous, moral, good, just, blameless, upright, honorable, honest, respectable, decent. These are terms that are such that describe and define the word righteous. I break it down like this. In layman's terms is doing what's right. Are you a righteous person? The word righteousness comes from the word righteous. These are words that probably everyone hearing this message would consider themselves to be. And again, not piously, not egotistically, not uh, in any braggart type of way. But with honesty and sincerity, they would consider themselves, you would consider yourselves to be a righteous person. And uh, these descriptions would fit your life in your own view, in your own mind. However, to further define the word as used in the scripture, the word righteousness would go on to mean, in addition, being right with God. I want you to follow me. This is just about as simple as I know how to make this message today in this relationship with the purpose, number one purpose, priority of a church. Righteousness connected, meaning one who is right with God. To be right with God, one must be righteous. Must be righteous in the description of these words that we talked about here. You see? That is, one must have humbled himself before God 
and received Christ into their heart and into the life for the salvation of their soul. That's the first step in being right with God. Accepting Jesus Christ and trusting him as Lord and Savior of your life. So in the light of that definition, we could say, yeah, we're righteous. We're righteous. We've made our hearts right with God. We've trusted Christ as our personal Savior. And so we are right with God through that new relationship. And many have done just that. Keep your ears open. But many have done this, but never won one soul to the Lord. What did Jesus say about his church? When he's talking to Peter, Peter, who do people say that I am? Ask the disciples, who do, who do people say that I am? And they gave this name, that name, this name. But Peter, who do you say that I am? And G, uh, Peter said, what? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In that relationship, we could say we're righteous because we, we placed our trust and faith in him. And so we have that. And that's the foundation upon which we build our lives. That's the foundation upon the church. He told Peter, it's, it's on this belief, it's on this faith that I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The only reason why a lot of churches have not already closed their doors is because there's still some that are faithful. There's still some that love God. There's still some that are concerned about the souls of others and not just their self. You see, being what God requires of one to be saved is only the first step to the next steps in life. Y'all with me? So we make reference to the word then obedience. Doing what is right. Being righteous means doing what is right. That's being obedient. What does that mean? We know what it meant when we was growing up and mom or daddy told us to do something. We didn't do it. We knew what that Disobedience had some consequences, didn't it? The word, the word obedience from the dictionary says compliance, agreement, submission, respect, duty, conformity, tractability, subservience, Meekness. We're talking about the word obedience. So I like to break these down in redneck layman's terms. Okay. So in layman's terms, I'm just, just saying, do what you're told. Y'all ever heard that from your mom, mom or daddy? Or anybody? Just, just do what you're told. I've used that lots of times. And I'm sure that God would tell me the same thing. Do what you're told, Phillips. <laughs> Obey me. Obedience has its rewards. Disobedience has its consequences. So that leads us to the word next in our phrase in the scripture. It says the fruit of the righteous. Now we know what fruit is, don't we? Define the word fruit. Well, in the dictionary it uses words such as berry, a pod, produce, bounty, harvest, crop, yield, the farmer can certainly relate to these terms. But in layman's terms, I break that down again to 
Fruit is what's grown or produced by the tree or the vine or the plant on which it hangs. A tomato plant produces what? It's supposed to produce tomatoes, isn't it? It's not going to produce carrots or cabbage. Huh? Cotton plants are going to produce what? Corn plants are going to produce what? Oh, you get the message, don't you? A Christian is going to produce what? Oops. A Christian is going to produce what? The fruit of the Spirit within. What's that? Well, look at Paul's writing in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and verse 23, where he said the fruit of the Spirit is love. I'm going slow. I don't want you to get ahead of me. Love. Joy. People who've got joy don't come to church look like they've had sour lemons for breakfast. Huh? Love. Joy. Peace. Now y'all trying to get ahead of me now because you're trying to say this verse in front of me. I want you to dwell on each word as I give it to you. Now listen to me. Love, joy. We're talking about what a Christian produces. We're talking about the fruit of a Christian. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Sometimes I'm not very gentle. Y'all can say amen, can't you? Sometimes he's not very gentle. You might say that this morning. I'm not being very gentle. But I'm going to be honest with you. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. The just shall live by faith. Meekness. Temperance. You see, the scripture says, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. So he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. As these fruits are being born, born from your tree, produced from your tree. Question is, Are you living right? I'm not, I'm not talking to, I'm not trying to put down anybody's character. Church people anywhere. I'm not trying to put down character by any means. We're talking about the number one priority reason for the church. The church, in a lot of ways, the true church, today in a lot of ways, is not getting good marks in today's society, is it? The church doesn't get the respect that it once got. I think I know the reason for that, and I think you do too. You may know it, but let me give you my reason. Because the church is to go into the world and preach the gospel, baptizing believers and making disciples. But in too many instances, and the problem that we face is the world has gotten into the church. And the church is trying to do things that will satisfy and make people happy. Paul had something to say about that. People having ticklish ears. Coming to hear what they want to hear. Now you, you, you probably don't want to hear what I'm going to have to say to you today, but... I'm going to say it and I'm going to finish this message, okay? Christians ought to live right. Do I hear an amen? Thank you. That's not, that's not saying amen, brother. I was just saying, so be it. That's the way it ought to be. That's the way Christians ought to live. They ought to live right. Not to please me, not to please you. 
but to please God. Amen. People ought, Christians ought to live right. But the front burner, the main activity of our lives, ought to be getting people saved. Churches everywhere are talking about decline in salvations. Talking about decline in church attendance. Every Christian ought to do everything he or she can do to win a soul to Christ. Don't let this go in one ear and out the other. This has been my message all of my life and I'm too old to change now. I try to tell you the truth. I try to share from you with you what God's word says. Whoever is listening today, whatever. Christians ought to live right. Not to please man, but to please our eternal heavenly father. You agree with that? Many times people say, I just, I, I win souls with just trying to live right. Well, lifestyle evangelism has its advantages. People are not going to listen to you if, about salvation if you don't have a life that backs it up. You ought to live right, but you'll not win anyone by living right. Your life is a tree of life. A tree of life. So says the word of God. Now, when people look at you, do they see Christ in you? In me? Do you, do you make them thirsty? By that, just simply mean that we talked about salt here a couple of weeks ago. Salt is a preservative and you are the salt of the earth the scripture says I said if you're a salt of the earth what you ought to be is what I'll say it a little louder Jay salty if you're the salt of the earth be salty so are we in our life living our life in such a close relationship with Christ that sinners are thirsty? Salt makes you thirsty. <clears throat> when people can look at you and say, I don't, I don't know what this person has, but whatever he's got, I want it. A Christian ought to have the love and joy and the peace and all these things that are so prevalent in our life that people say, I want what this guy's got. I'm going to watch him because I, I want what he's got. But that won't convert anyone. No one will be saved just by watching your life. Hear me out. You witness to people when souls to Christ by telling them how to get saved. Somebody told you, didn't they? Somebody led you to Christ. Somebody led you through the sinner's prayer. Somebody showed their love to you and the Holy Spirit convicted you only the Holy Spirit can draw you to Christ but you and I are the tools the vessels that God uses to tell folks about Jesus you witness to people by telling them how to get saved because the Bible says faith comes by hearing not viewing faith comes by hearing and hearing by what the word of God you can live it you can do all of these things, but if you're going to win a soul to Christ, you've got to tell somebody about Jesus and how to get saved. How many of you saved today? How'd you get saved? See, however you got saved, 
Other folks get saved the same way. Do you know the Apostle Paul got saved the same way you and I do? Oh, it wasn't the same experience. It wasn't the same dramatic type of experience like the Apostle Paul. But it's the Holy Spirit of God that convicts you. When Paul was struck to the ground and he looked up and he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? You don't know what it was. You can't explain it. But somewhere along the way, the Holy Spirit convicted your heart and you realized you needed to be saved. Someone led you just like they did the Apostle Paul. And Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 and verse 13 and 14. Let me give it to you very quickly. He says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? In whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, there it is, preacher. It finally come back. It's all your fault. That's what folks want to say. Oh, that's a scripture I was looking for. It's the preacher's fault. Amen. You are exactly right. It's the preacher's fault. Preacher here means the heralder, the exhorter. It's the one who tells people about Christ. And every one of you are preachers if you're saved by the grace of God. We're not talking about the office, the ministry of pastoral work. We're talking about proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. I didn't like that. Mr. Preacher, are you sure that's what that means? Yeah, that's what that means. We are to be soul winners. We're to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm just telling you, folks, this is what the Bible says. This is what God says. And we're to be righteous people. We're to be right with God. We're to live, live right. We're to all these things. But we're to tell folks about Jesus. We're going to sing in a little while the song. Lead me to some soul today. Why would you want God to lead you to some soul if you're not going to tell him anything? Huh? Are you with me? You are the preacher. You are the soul winner. You're the one to tell people about Christ. We are to be preachers. God said in our text, He that winneth souls is wise. So the last question is, are you wise? Are you listening today? Are you wise? Do you consider yourself to be a wise person? Wisdom, we're told, in Holy Scripture comes from God. The instruction for the church is to go into all the world. Let's see, now who's the church? If you're a church, raise your hand. Yeah, there's a church. There's a church. There's a church. For the church. It tells the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You see, it takes faith to believe, it takes hearing to have the knowledge. But it takes wisdom from God to believe what you have heard. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is the Word of God. 
We either believe it and put it into practice or we hear it and don't heed it. Telling the world that we don't really believe it either. Oh, I'd never say that. But if our life is a testimony of that we're afraid to tell somebody about Jesus or we don't tell anybody about Jesus, it's the same as telling them, well, we don't believe it either. Because God has promised to give us the power. You see, the saving power of man's soul is not in you or me, but it's in God alone. But you and I are the instruments. We are the tools. We are the ambassadors to take the message to a lost and dying world. We are to take the message of Christ to those across the street, those next door, to those that we work with, those that we come in contact with. Our message is to be about Jesus Christ. I don't care about this politically correct junk we have a job to do that God assigned to us and it has nothing to do with political correctness. When you fail to instruct people in the word of God, it's either a disbelief, it's a disobedience, or it's just willful rebellion. Are you a righteous person? Are you right with God? Is your heart right with God? What does Holy Scripture say? The wisest men on earth, the wisest men on earth, hear and heed the word of God. Are you a wise person? When a person makes up his mind to be a soul winner, to tell somebody about Jesus, he recognizes that that he is dependent upon the wisdom of God to do so. He is dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God to lead that person to an understanding of that need within their heart within their, in their life to accept Christ into their heart and their life. Man's without hope, eternally lost, doomed for a devil's hell without the wisdom of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, and without the hearing of the message of Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility and we need to recognize that God is the one that gives salvation. But we are the tool to take them to that place of understanding. We depend upon the leadership of God. We depend upon the power of God. We depend upon the spirit of God, the word of God. When souls are being won to Christ, being saved, but led to Christ, it's done by wise Christians. And whenever that takes place, the church grows. And God is glorified. Church, we along with all local New Testament churches, we must get back to the basics. If you're going to keep the doors open on a church for congregational worship, we've got to get back to the basics of reaching out and touching souls with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Leading them to a saving knowledge of the Savior. Or the decline will not stop, or will it be reversed? We're living in the last days. We're living in the days of the Laodicean church. Read about it in Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. He talks about being lukewarm. Talks about people saying, I'm rich, I'm increased with goods, have need of nothing. We're not aware that we're wretched and poor and blind to the needs of others. The Laodicean church was one that God said he wasn't pleased with.
Have thy affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Brother Jay, come and lead us in an invitation number. You know your heart. You know your life today. You know what's needful in our life to be what God would have us to be. To do the right thing. To obey our Heavenly Father. The question is, will we do it? Stand together.